Okay, how about that? Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I just want to do a little housekeeping before I get started. For those of you not familiar with this building, the restrooms are downstairs. So if you just walk down the full flight of stairs, you'll see them right in front of you, and they are on either side of the building. We have uh, guest Wi-Fi for you, and that um, there's one all the way over there, a little placard on the table, and also where you checked in. So for those of you needing Wi-Fi, please um, make your way, not now, but at some later date um, there. So I want to welcome everyone to this really exciting and important event today. My name is Gina Samuels. And before I even begin, I'd like for us to just kind of take a second to come into the room. And if you will, um, this is as much for me as it will be for you, to um, just do a big exhale, inhale through your uh, nose and exhale through your mouth just to come into the space. Ready? Do it one more time. Inhale. Exhale. Thank you. I speak because I know my needs. I speak with hesitation because I know not yours. My words come from my life experience. Your understanding comes from yours. Because of this, what I say and what you hear may not be the same. So if you will listen carefully, but not with your ears, to what I say, but not with my tongue, maybe we can communicate. So since we are in a space that I teach, and I've been here for 21 years, I'm reminded of this poem that I share with my students every year, first year master's students, about what it means to um, not just move through the world with speech and speech that you have in your brain, but how to speech, speak with integrity. I also share it now with you as a reminder of just how vulnerable we all are, how easy it is to be misunderstood or maybe worse yet, to be accurately understood in a way that we wish we were not seen or may willfully disregard. I ask that today we all listen not to be right or to be validated, but with the intention to build community connection and to more deeply understand as well as to be understood. For this, in my opinion, is the purpose of true communication, speech that is located and practiced through community. It is not by accident that these words share the same linguistic root. So a lot of times when I um, have reached out to folks about reimagining the university, they say something like, well, what the hell is that? Or why am I here? The panelists, many are like, well, how did I get here? And so there's many answers to this question, but I thought it might be useful to share for a minute with you um, some of the answers I give. So the literal and present, we are here because of a lot of people worked really, really hard to make this happen. And so I just wanna for a moment acknowledge um, some of those folks. So the CSRPC, staff, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture um, staff, uh, Tracy, the Executive Director, Marilyn, Tierra, Anaga, and Alice, our students, uh, Fearlessly Taylor, and Dee Dee, and Diana are somewhere around here. And so thank you to all of you. I also want to thank Crown staff and Logan staff who have been generous with their time and their talents to give us the space that we will be in today here this morning and then also later this afternoon when we go into Logan. So thank you so much for them. And also to the Centering Race Consortium, Mellon Grant folks who are sparsed around here. Some of them are clustered at different tables. Um, they are the schools that we are in partnership with that also helps us to put on this convening today. Um, and those folks represent the schools of Brown, Stanford, and Yale, and they are present here and also chose some of the panelists that you will hear from today. So thank you to all of you. But there is also a why are we here that is not so distant in our past around the reimagining the university project itself, which is a project that has many roots and branches. It first began for me as a friendship between myself and a junior colleague, as we both lamented, I guess, many things and maybe over a glass of wine. We wrestled with finding ways of trying to do our scholarship in ways that first honored the people and communities in which that knowledge was embedded to not cause more trauma or harm, to engage them as more than subject or even interlocutors from which we would extract knowledge. 
but to accompany and bear witness to these knowers in sharing their experiences and analyses of their own lives, their own histories, their own needs, hopes, and imagined futures. So I would like to honor and thank her as my original thought partner and also those of you at UChicago who were present at that, our first but small global convening. So you know the Gonzalez, Alice, Erin, Shipra, S, Elizabeth, and Selena. If you are here, please stand. And I would like to just honor them. And also the first year of awardees. So last year was our first year as the Race Center where we granted staff, faculty, and students with reimagining grants to help open up the platform of voices that helped us to do that. And many of them are here today, and you will actually get to see some installments from them later today. So I also want to thank them. And so just know that you are now all officially part of our community, a community that I hope grows. Those of you online, you too are part of this community. Um, and we, we welcome your voice and your imaginings of how this place can be grander and greater and bigger and better. Also want to announce uh, the last piece of housekeeping that we have extended, we're doing this grantee work again this year. So we've extended our due date um, for next Friday. So those of you who want to um, take your reimaginings that happened today into life, into some project, I welcome your, um, your submission. Welcome to Reimagining the University. So where is here, right? So how do we get here and where is here? It is likely and very probable that my own personal and intergenerational origin story is always what draws me into valuing deep and sometimes messy origin story work and feeling that origins are critical to shaping any kind of liberatory or reimagining work. And this brings me to considering the purpose of land acknowledgements. And I have to say, I struggled a lot about whether or not I was going to do this, not because um, I don't think that land acknowledgements are important, but because many times I feel as though they're delivered like obligatory apologies for some distant time or place to a group of people who we presume are relics of the past, something that one who is often not native does before proceeding on with the day's events. Whose needs are then being served by that? And as I yesterday emerged from, or not yesterday now, it's two days ago, emerged from a land and acknowledgement committee working group where we again lamented uh, all of the other complexities, I was left thinking, Ugh, am I gonna do it? Am I not gonna do it? What would I do? Why would I do it? Why would I start this way? What should be the purpose of this moment in our time together? But I was also left wanting to find some way to still acknowledge our origins, our origin story, and our beginnings, and to remind ourselves and me, myself that the history is still unfolding, that we are still living out this moment, and this reality must be made part of it for all of us. I also know that neutrality, objectivity, and silence, this university's frequent policy, or wrote acknowledgement of historical fact will not ever bring us to the reimagined socially just place that I am yearning for. At least that's what I think. So instead, I'm gonna ask us all, what is your relationship to the origins of this place we call Chicago? To knowing the very name derived from the Algonquin name of the river that runs through this city, that this land we're sitting on is in this building now called Crown, but before that called SSA, so you may hear me call it in that old name, is, not was, the home to Three Fires Confederacy among many other tribes. The origin story of this place includes settler violence, relocation, forced displacement, and forced return to native nations, of native nations back to Chicago. In fact, some of you may know that Chicago holds the third largest native population in the country with 65,000 urban native populations and representing 175 different tribes. This is still a native place. Right across the street is a lovely grassy area that most of us here call the Midway, but if you're fancy, you call it the Prestance. But in 1893, Chicago put on the World's Columbian Exposition, a fair boasting worldwide news that anthropologist Frederick Putman, who was to feature American Indians in a series of live exhibits. The fair was claimed by Carl Smith to be the most successful of all world fairs. What is an honorable use today of this space? 
The reimagine the university to reimagine it, the university in particular, this university in particular, how do we accurately and fully call into relation other histories of this place? How can we as staff, students, faculty, and administrators, as well as community members and comrades honor these relations? What would it mean to link the ongoing colonial present with other struggles, with Black Lives Matter, with disability justice, with LGBTQIA plus and trans justice, with abolition movements, with seeking social justice for all forms of oppression across the infinite divides that we as human beings create. It is from a deep place of my knowing that I believe any reimagining of the university must be grounded in a revolutionary choice to reconfigure, to rectify our relationships as knowers to our full stories our integrated stories, our inextricably linked stories, and acting from a place that honors, heals, and transforms power across those relations collectively. So what might action look like? This is now the question before me and before us. Here are just two examples, in case you all are so moved that exist in Chicago, and you may not know. The first is Shy Nations, which is a group of um, native activists and members of Chicago land broadly. And if you are so moved to donate, the blue hashtag will allow you to do so. The American Indian Center is also another site for remembrance, survivance, and thrival of native peoples here in the urban center. These activities are located throughout Chicago, and I encourage you to check them out, particularly if you are from here. So as I said before, I like origin stories. So this is yours truly. I am probably two. Um, and there is not an accident as to why I entitled this uh, Race, Freedoms, White Supremacy, Culture, Reactions from an Outsider Within. I am, you cannot see this, but I am on a beach where I am a definitely an outsider within. I am on Lake Superior, the furthest, most north place of Wisconsin. I assure you, I was the only brown spot on an entire uh, beach. And yet being my reflective self, even there, I was asking, where am I from? Why am I here? How am I situated in this space? I don't come from a place like this. And honestly, when I came here to get this, to have this job, I came only because it was the closest place my job, uh, I had a job offer that allowed me to still get home to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, to take care of my then very ailing mother. And yet I have to recognize and acknowledge that as an outsider within this space, in fact, this very building is inextricably tied to my origin story. As you guys came in, you might have noticed these very uh, big, ginormous uh, hanging posters of faces that make up SSA, I told you I'd do it, crowns, um, origin story itself. And on the far over there, there's a poster that's called Helen Harris Perlman. And in the 1960s, my adoptive mom lived here. She was a social worker at Hull House, and she was faced with a very difficult consideration in her life. She was 42, she had just gotten divorced, she had had a major surgery that rendered her unable to have children. And she was making a decision about whether or not she was gonna come back to school and get her PhD here, or she was gonna become a mother. And at that time, she felt this was a choice that she had to make. And someone told her at Hull House, you need to go talk to Helen Harris Perlman. She will, she will tell you what to do. So even back then, I have personal testimony that this was the place to define problems and find solutions. So my mother came in and found Helen. And Helen told her, you know, basically, screw the PhD, go, go be a mom. And so she did. And so here I am. And so my journey here, as much as I like to also find safety in calling myself an outsider, because this place often feels like a completely different world, I have to acknowledge that this place also has had an undeniable effect on who I am. I now represent the 1.9% of faculty who identify as black women here on this campus with tenure. That may be also why I feel like an outsider within. And what I'll be calling out today is not new to those of us who occupy similar outsider statuses on this space or others. But I still name these because, well, we sometimes still need reminding about the water we swim in. Some of you may be familiar with the parable of the fish. 
um, best delivered, I think, by David Foster Wallace's remarkable 2005 commencement speech at Kenyon College. And it goes something like this. There's two fish swimming along in the water and an older fish passes them by and says, hey boys, how's the water? And they both swim on. And after a moment, one of the younger fish looks at the other fish and says, what the hell is water? And I feel like there are a lot of things that are just like that, where we kind of know it. And when somebody says it, we go, mm-hmm. But it's also very easy, and I would argue almost necessary for us to keep swimming by, because if you constantly notice, this is water, this is water, it will exhaust you. And so I'm wanting to call out white supremacy culture because I think it's in our water. And I think it would be very hard to convince me that it's not. And so I'm going to use my privilege here for a moment to call our attention to this in that specific way. So how many of you have seen the list of white supremacy culture things that are attributed to white supremacy culture before? Just raise your hand so I know how much to go of this. Because like, there's maybe half of us. Um, so I'll just kind of read these out. And it's so tiny on here, I'm going to have to turn around and do this this way because I'm old and I can only see in certain forms. So white supremacy culture, the idea being that there are certain things that sort of bubble up that to our attention that we end up performing and behaving that are attributable to white supremacy culture things like and these will become familiar to you and you may not attribute them to white supremacy culture things like either or thinking worship of the written word worship of objectivity individualism quantity over quality power hoarding fear of open conflict a sense of urgency, defensiveness, paternalism. Progress is bigger, better, more, right? Belief in one right way, the right to comfort, and perfectionism, something that many of my students ail from. And I want to emphasize that these are my reflections and observations of being in the space personally, being in the space professionally, and I would argue even ethnographically for 21 years. So I got a lot of data. I use this as a frame because white supremacy culture is everywhere. It's in the water and especially lives in a place like this. It flows through this university's beloved conventions of Chicago principles of freedom of expression, of the Calvin principles that value organizational neutrality on political matters, it is a damaging and toxic part of an organization's culture because it promotes white supremacy thinking and doing. It damages us all. I use white supremacy culture rather than locating this as a racialized positionality because people of color, everyone, are socialized not just those of us who are those of you who are racially white, can culturally still endorse, claim, wield, and reinforce this culture. In fact, our very survival requires all of us to engage in one way or another. So it relates to all of us and we relate to all of it, everyone. So as I move through these slides and share my own observations of it, I ask you to consider as I earlier did, how are you in relation to white supremacy? So the first one I wanna call out, don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all of these. I'm just gonna go through two. My favorite. So the first one that I find comes up a lot is right to comfort. And this looks all kinds of different ways, but I'm just going to I'm just going to share a few thoughts here. The right to comfort. The first way I've oftentimes seen this showed up is I'm OK. It's you. I'm all, I'm all right. I'm all, I'm fine. But it's you. Right. This came up once for me when I was in a conversation with an administrator who I'll, I'll leave unnamed um, that I said, you know, when we complain about stuff like this, like, what do you think of those of us who complain to you all the time about, you know, objectivity isn't real or freedom of expression only happens for some people? And he, and he said to me, well, I think, you know, you just have to toughen up. Right. You just have to toughen up like we do. And I'm thinking, wow, but we who's we like, what, what is that? The second one. My, one of my favorites as a researcher is prove it. So how many times do we on college campuses express our disdain and then all of a sudden a magical study has to occur? We have to have data. And then after the data happens, what happens? <laughs> you said it. 
right? So it's this prove it. But even when we have data, then there must be something wrong with the tool if it generates the result that doesn't reify the dominant think or the dominant ontology. The fourth, or the next one, the third one, I'm okay with hate, it's worth it. I was at an event the other day where someone on a panel said, I think hate speech is a necessary part of free speech. Well, how convenient as a not person of color to be okay with that, right? I'm not okay with hate speech. I would argue it is a fundamentally different thing than sharing an idea or a thought. It does something different. Its purpose is different. The fourth, one monocentric or mono racist and that's just a fancy way of saying um, thinking the one right way the one right thing um, box that i showed you earlier or mono racist feeling that there is one racialized uh, ontology or epistemology that is right ways of inclusion aka you're welcome here just don't change here right we don't want to change anything about here we just want you to feel that you belong and what, I, and what I always tell people is, I don't want to belong to a hot soup of mess. I don't want to belong to a toxic thing. I want you to change, and then I shouldn't have to work to be included. I should just be included because I'm here, right? So that's why I say that's monoracist. Next is denouncing accountability or responsibility. Ignoring that there is a difference between bigoted and bullying behavior between that and a legitimate idea. Right? That these things are not equivalents. Being racist, being bigoted, those aren't ideas. Right? And this is all made possible in a context that fetishizes objectivity and believes that that's possible or believes that there's one way to practice that or that it, silence is the practice of that. Right? And in fact, that objectivity is a moral virtue rather than a power evading strategy to protect status quo of white supremacy culture. So this is sort of how it goes. An organizational structure and conventions are set up to prevent free and open challenge to power structure and to engage in ways that only reinforce dominant ontology, that means reality and knowing, or sometimes not knowing, or what others have referred to as willful ignorance and others at a panel I was at referred to as structural stupidity. Criticism of those with power is viewed as threatening, inappropriate, outright rude, disrespectful, uncivil, and thus dangerous. That goes back to that right to comfort, right? So when we feel un uncomfortable, it feels like I'm, I'm in danger. And then for those of you who are social work students, we talk a lot about defense mechanisms that are normal in the human body, but defensiveness. So the use of power when this happens and when the power structure feels anxiety, it doubles down on white supremacy culture and its overt affirm affirmation and protection of its freedoms within institutions to relieve anxiety of power structure and the people it benefits. This is not just my opinion, but others have written about this too. If you are interested, I am happy to share that with you. So a second process that I find happens quite a bit is this power hoarding of freedoms. And what does it really mean in this sort of paradox to be particularly on this campus where we constantly extol the freedom of expression, but many of us feel like, mm, that ain't for all of us. So the first go of you were familiar in 2020, our Dean of Students put out a welcome to Tobias. Like, yes, I remember. So those of you who are on campus will definitely remember in 2020, University of Chicago's uh, Dean of Students issued a statement, a welcome, no less, a welcome statement that said, we don't do safe spaces or trigger warnings. Welcome, Strap, <laughs> buckle up, kind of was the, the feeling, as you might imagine, that garnered quite a bit of uh, press and a lot of different reactions to that, right? Um, but I would argue when that went out, I thought, well, yeah, we do. The whole campus is a safe space for some people. The whole campus is a safe space. So you do do safe spaces. You just don't do them in counter for other folks, right? So feeling entitled to safety, comfort all the time and expecting it as a priority of how something should happen 
right? But instead, pathologizing the idea, right? Not seeing the water that you're swimming in, not seeing that, and instead saying, well, who would need a safe space? Who would need that? Why do you need a safe space? As a special need for marginalized groups while ignoring the ongoing dominance of white supremacy. Next is, you know, we do though, what we do do absolutely is curate elite and a restricted spaces within which to have conversations, to share certain knowledge, to know certain things, who are knowers, who have access to those elite spaces, right? To curate access to certain kinds of dialogues and exchanges of knowing and information that marginalize and further silence other groups structurally. Some speakers and actors get to practice the freedom while others don't. And finally, using the threat of bigotry and racism to co-opt silence, censor, or hoard culture, cult comfort. So what I would argue here is what oftentimes happens when I'm in an argument like this, which I find myself often times arguing around free speech and that sort of thing. One of my beloved colleagues will say to me, well, but Gina, you know, would you, would you, would you be okay with like, what if, well, what if somebody had came here for a campus talk and they wanted to argue that they found a study that showed that black people's heads were smaller and we were stupider or something, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am, yes. And so there's always this, you know, like, yes, it's happened four weeks ago. All of these examples are things that have happened within the last four weeks, people. So, and I think, wow, so what, are you threatening me? So like, if I do my thing, you're gonna do your thing? Like, if you just told me you're that, like, what's, what are we doing here? Right? So this threat of like this danger is looming and either we play it fully open or you leave me alone and we play it the way that I want to play it. And the last one that I'll pull out about this is the idea of what I would call epistemic bigotry, this kind of knowledge bigotry, this use of we. Here at UChicago, we, or here at wherever, we, who is that? Who speaks on behalf of all of us in this way? And often I find myself in an audience kind of, <laughs> it's not me, you're not talking about me. So back to this projection, what this ends up doing in my observation is that it just becomes this mass projection project and pretty much everything that gets thrown in my direction is actually how the other person is feeling. Right? This other person's feeling anxiety, they're telling me I'm feeling anxiety, that I need special whatever, that I or my group needs coddling or protection or special help to make it in this Darwinistic place. That distorting racial and social justice as a threat to freedom rather than as a threat to injustice and lack of freedom. Social justice doesn't threaten freedom. Being for it and valuing social justice is the path to everyone's freedom. Contorting misinformation about historical or scientific fact as an idea or a political versus personal you know, idea. So the idea that you would say a fact like this land, there were people here before us. That's not a political statement. That's fact, right? If I were to say something like the world is round, that no longer is a political statement or a risky subjective opinion, right? It's just kind of like fact. So I would argue that we're in need of sort of expanding the things that which we agree upon are fact today. We have a lot of science about that would support the importance of racial justice and social justice. We don't need any more studies on that. No apology to my beloved colleagues who study that. <laughs> or apologies, I'm sorry. So dear human beings, what if we liberated ourselves from white supremacy culture? What if freedoms were collective practices that co-constituted the betterment of society, that we just didn't speak to speak, but we actually spoke to communicate? What if we valued social justice and racial justice? What if we measured our success in relation to those goals, to those values? And what if we imagine freedom as our collective liberation from white supremacy culture? What if we reimagine this together in all of our practices on this campus, in our teaching, in our thinking, in our learning, 
in our knowledge and who can be a knower, in our scholarship and who gets to be called even a scholar. And the purpose of anyone's speech and action in consideration of what it produces for all communities. What is your reimagined university? So today, so I have lots of tasks up here. So today, I would like you to ask some of these questions to yourself. What is your own relationship or what do you think is the relationship between white supremacy culture and the practice and protections of freedom? What are your answers to that? What does freedom even mean? What would that feel like to you, look like? What does it mean to practice that? As I talked a little bit about, but what is the role of race and racism and other social statuses and structures in determining whose knowledge, expertise, experiences, and access to freedom counts? Who gets to say so? And how does campus culture, policy, and climate encourage, uplift, protect, suppress, patrol, or censure knowledge, experience, and knowers, particularly from marginalized and oppressed communities and positionalities? So I ask you to think about these things and come to your own answers, and you may not come to your answers by the end of the day, because this is a lifelong process. I've changed my own opinion on these many times. So with that, thank you for listening. I would like to ask the panelists, the first panelists, to come up to the stage and find your places. Tricia, maybe if I put you here. And I'm going to introduce the first panel. You can tell we've practiced this many times in advance. <laughs> I just told their instructions were just go up there and sit wherever. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, everybody. So, Dr. Tricia Rose, I will introduce, and then the questions are such that each person will introduce themselves. And in your flyer, you also have their impressive bio. So I encourage you to read them because this is an incredibly impressive group of people here. I feel deeply honored that everyone is here. So Dr. Tricia Rose, who will be moderating the panel, is Chancellor's Professor of Africana Studies, Associate Dean of the Faculty for Special Initiatives, and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University. She is also a colleague of our Mellon Foundation um, Centering Race Consortium grant that I mentioned earlier uh, today, this morning, and has graciously agreed to moderate this panel this morning. Tricia, I will turn it over to you, and thank you, everyone. Hello? There you go. Well, but you'll need yours in just two seconds. When I... <laughs> you can pass it over. I can pass it over. All right, let's yeah. see what happens. Let's hold on to that one. Sure. All right, we're all together now. How are we doing? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of this ongoing conversation. Um, we're going to have a, a, a dialogue. No, we're not making sort of massive presentations, or they're not making <laughs> massive presentations on their work, but sharing work around the questions that that's driving the conference as a whole. So the first thing I think we would want to do is give you a sense of the incredible work that the panelists have done in so far as it specifically relates to what we're working on. So if you could just focus a little bit on um, this, this question of sort of how your scholarship, your teaching, your pedagogy, your uh, approach to research, is connected to this question of how we might reimagine the university. If that's if there's a way to connect those things, and of course, just obviously tell us what you're excited about working on. And we will start with you. you will have the mic. I'll take the back. Oh, great. Good morning, everyone. I hope you all can hear me all right. Um, my name is Eugen Park. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford University, um, and just you'll see it in my bio. But really broadly, my work is around. Um, how Asian American communities negotiate their racialization through education and in educational institutions. That means both in schools and also in community um, spaces. 
So that's a little bit about my work more broadly. Um, but for today, I really want to talk to you all to uh, about a project, uh, a community based project, I shouldn't even call it a project, it's a, um, a collaboration uh, with some folks at the HANA Center, which is up in the Northwest, some of y'all may be familiar, they're in Albany Park. Um, and so I've been involved with the HANA Center for a long time. And um, over the last, uh, I can't count, so I'll say since 2019, 2020, we've been involved in a collaboration related to um, how the question of bringing in uh, Korean Americans into um, the uh, fight for racial and social justice. What does it mean to enter into this uh, as Korean Americans, as Asian Americans? And so um, I can share a little bit more about this later, but that evolved into a community group that we call GBG, which is um, actually based on a Korean word, kobugi, which means turtle, because the idea is that we are moving very slowly and determinedly towards our goal. Um, and so uh, this has resulted in, or this project is, um, like I said, a community collaboration between myself and Hana Center. Some of you all may know um, In Ha Choi, the executive director there. And so um, it's been a really long-term process of um, kind of inviting in community members, figuring out what our community members are concerned about, want uh, thinking about, and, um, and sort of trying to make up or building up out spaces that we can um, talk about what it means for us as Korean Americans to enter into this. And so I'll share a little bit more about it as the, as the panel continues, but I just wanted to share a little bit about that to sort of set the foundation for the um, conversation. Um, I'm Lisa Biggs. Thank you so much to everyone, um, to Gina and everyone who's brought the, um, the, this opportunity together. It's been really tremendous. Uh, I've just been here for the last couple hours, but I'm, I'm really I'm from, from the south side of Chicago, and I went to lab school, so I'm I'm representing my maroon owl. Yes, I was a lab rat the whole time. Um, <laughs> it's so lovely to be to be home. I'm also a Northwestern grad, and um, I I'm a theater person. I um, at Brown. I'm a professor in Africana studies. I teach black theater and performance studies. And I do that work because I'm really interested in the role of black expressive cultures in the transformation of, of, of society. Um, and how this underappreciated, the singing, the humming, the dancing, the storytelling, the poetry, the handshakes, the head nods, the moments. Um, form alternative communities and communicate things that cannot be expressed in the written word, but are deeply felt in the heart and the soul and the body, and that make community, despite all the white supremacy culture going on, and through all the white supremacy culture going on, and against the backdrop of all the white supremacy culture going on. So most recently, I've been um, writing about theater and dance programs for women who are incarcerated in the US and also a site in South Africa and thinking about theater and storytelling very broadly with writ as a practice of healing. Um, I came to that work very circuitous route, but I'm an actor and a playwright. And um, I had a chance to work with a group of women in Washington, DC, who were in a comprehensive drug and alcohol recovery program who eventually became my teachers. And um, and so they invited me to think about what, what they meant by healing, not what I was taught about Western healing processes or really cures and um, that huge emphasis on end result. That, that work is um, related to the work in black theater that I've been doing for decades as an actor and my own um, more recent work as a playwright the last piece that I created, Afterlife, was about the Detroit 67 Rebellion. I used to be a professor at Michigan State University, and a couple years before the 50th anniversary of the 67 Rebellion, so this is the Rebellion, the 50th anniversary is 2017, so about 2015, 2014, I turned to my undergrads and asked them what they knew about the unrest, and almost to a person they said, a group of crazy militant new girls built, uh, burned Detroit down for no reason. 
which I knew was not true, um, but that was the narrative that they had learned, uh, including the Detroiters, just put that out there. Um, so I began a process of working with them, collaborating with them, and with community members in Detroit to tell a much bigger story about what happened. And the piece that we created, Afterlife, is something, one of the most, uh, the projects that I'm most proud of because it weaves um, archival material and oral histories, poetry, song, and dance to tell the story of, of Detroit through the lens of women and girls who lived through the unrest and in doing it in a way that we were able to return to the, the land right three blocks down the street from where the unrest began to tell this story and in collaboration with partners invite people who had not been to that space in, in weeks and months and years and decades back in to be part of a, a community conversation about what Detroiters need and how the narrative violence of the angry militant Negro was um, shaping public policy, people's sense of community, self and belonging, and preventing people from getting um, the things that they needed so that they could flourish. So when I, I think about my work, it's um, I am an actor and a playwright, but I am deeply first and foremost committed to the work as a practice of liberation and of healing and of transformation. Oh, yeah, good, okay. Um, well, first, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate being here and being a part of the community now um, and on this amazing panel. Uh, so my name is Zelda Roland. I'm the founding director of the Yale Prison Education Initiative at Dwight Hall. I'm also the director of our partnership with the University of New Haven um, together. Well, I will say I got into this work as a graduate student at Yale. Uh, I started volunteering in a nearby prison education program in a men's maximum security prison. and. Uh, the students in that program, which was run through Wesleyan University, were hands down, I've been teaching at Yale for a while at that point, and they were hands down the best, brightest, most ambitious, most omnivorous students I'd ever met. And um, I started looking around and realized that there were all these faculty members, all these graduate students, all these undergraduate staff members, formerly incarcerated alumni who were on our college campus, but there had never been a real credit-bearing Yale College program before that actually saw incarcerated students as participants in the university in a real way, right? Only volunteer programs or inside-out programs in which students on campus received credit for the same work students in prison were doing, but the students in prison didn't receive any credit for it whatsoever. So <clears throat> I started thinking, um, I started trying to build this program at Yale, and we pulled together faculty, graduate students, undergraduates, and formerly incarcerated alumni of other programs in the region to think about what would a program at Yale look like and how would we build it. And crucially, it was the students in that prison where I had been working who really knew the value of what that program could be because they knew not just the demand for real liberal arts college programs. You may know that in a lot of our prisons, education is seen as a reentry program. Uh, you know, if you're within five years release, you'll have access to college. And even then, usually technical or vocational education, people in prison aren't seeing as being worthy of the kinds of rigorous liberal arts college programs we offer on a campus like this. Um, they, a lot of these students had transferred from other prisons just to just for the chance to apply to this program. And they said, we know that if you could start a new program, it would reach so many more students, but also it would make a huge impact for other institutions looking at Yale as an example, that it could actually cause a ripple effect. They knew that better than I did. Um, and what none of us really maybe thought about at the time was the way that a program like this could transform the institution, which I think is why I'm on this panel today, um, for the ways that we've thought about a program like this transforming individuals, yes, but also institutions 
such as the correctional institutions where we work and the university institutions, right, that we have contact with, the faculty, the students, and the campus. So when we first started this program, uh, many administrators at Yale told me, uh, no, <laughs> you know, no, they didn't say no, actually. This is part of the water, right? Nobody ever says no. Uh, it was more of a, this, this seems very unlikely that we'll ever be able to offer real Yale credits to students in prison. And nobody will ever be the administrator to say, no, this isn't happening. It's always someone above me or the powers that be up there. It's just, it's just not possible. Um, in fact, I, I went to colleagues at the Bard Prison Initiative in New York State and they also said, there's just no chance. You will never pull it off at a place like Yale. Uh, well, it did, it did take quite a bit of work. It was a massive lobbying campaign, a lot of organizing. There was no point um, at which Yale spontaneously said, yes, we think this is a really good idea. Uh, we should have a prison education program. We believe that students in prison should be seen as real worthy college students with transcripts uh, but after a lot of patience some patience maybe a little bit of impatience i should say uh, we offered our first credit bearing yale courses for students in prison in 2018 at two different prisons including our main site today still uh, a maximum security prison uh, just about 50 minute drive from downtown New Haven, the largest prison in the Northeast, 1,500 incarcerated men there, and 600 people applied for our first 12 person cohort. Ooh. So that just gives you a sense of the need and the desire that we're facing. And we're also, you know, looking at, we, and, we, and we, we only can admit 12 students because of these constraints, right, in the water. <laughs> I'm going to keep coming back to those fish. Um, but so we've been running continuously since 2018, and we have an incredible, powerful cohort of students at that men's prison. Last year, we also uh, started up a program at the Women's Federal Prison in Danbury, Connecticut. Uh, we found out this summer we're currently the only college program being offered to any women in any federal prison in the US, which is really upsetting. And another way of rephrasing that is until a year ago, there were no college programs for any women in any federal prison in the US. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. Another, another thing that I'll just mention before I pass that I, I, I'd love to talk about and I think touches on the themes of this conference, a huge component of well, I should say in 2021, we also established a partnership with the University of New Haven so that our students could earn degrees in prison, two and four year degrees, the AA and the bachelor's degree. Now, of course, we had to establish this partnership for a degree because we haven't yet been able to convince Yale to offer its own degrees. But that is part of what is our, you know, part of our long term goal and ambition. So we have Yale credits that transfer into this University of New Haven degree and we celebrated our first graduation. Um, this June. It was very exciting. Uh, but a big component of our program right now is what we call the College to Career Fellowship, where we are bringing formerly incarcerated alumni of any college and prison program. It's a competitive fellowship for any alumni of any college and prison program to come to our campus uh, to be affiliated with Dwight Hall, which is where YPEI sits. It's the Center for Public Service and Social Justice at Yale. And to um, receive professional development and mentorship opportunities through uh, affiliations with different host sites on campus. So I, I sort of think of it as maybe a Fulbright for formerly incarcerated alumni. And the core principle here is, is giving people time and space, the way that people graduating from conventional campuses are afforded the privilege of time and space to figure out the next um, chapter, right, in their lives towards a, a future career. Uh, like Kathy 
Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm I'm passing. Thank you the time and space. The <laughs> the fellowships program is something that helps us think about taking the university and redistributing it, right? Um, I'll just end there. Great. Uh, how's everybody doing? Yeah. Uh, I am thrilled to be on this panel with these amazing folks. I want to thank Gina and Tracy and everybody affiliated with CSRPC for pulling this together. I, I mentioned to them I'm very excited to be in conversation about um, reimagining the university. I am Kathy Cohen. I'm sorry about that. I'm Kathy Cohen. I actually teach here at the University of Chicago and I am the chair of the new Department of Race, Diaspora, and Indigeneity. We, we're clapping for that. I know. Uh, it's hard to believe, isn't it, at this place? But, um, and I, I, I guess I want to start with kind of how do we get to the work, and I'll be quick, and then no, we can, we can be okay. in conversation, which is um, to say that I don't think of the work as something that's extra. To me, the extra is actually just being here. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is uh, I'm a first generation college student. Um, you know, I thought, do I say this or not? Not in a bad way. My mother didn't graduate from high school, right? I didn't, when I walk on this campus, I don't feel comfortable, even though I have been here forever. And I think many colleagues think that this is a natural place for me. But it is still a place where I wonder, do I fit, where we still go through imposter syndrome, where I still feel like it's a constant struggle. Um, and so the work that I think some people would designate as a kind of work of transformation is the work where I actually feel like I can breathe and feel at home. So when I teach the course at Stateville with Alice Kim, those are the most amazing students ever, yes, but those are the most, the students that I feel most familiar with. They could be my brother or my nephew or my cousin, right? In a way that often the students in my classroom, as wonderful as they are, have a distance from me, right? As a working class black lesbian. Um, I'm here, I think, to say a bit about how we get to RDI, which is race, diaspora, and indigeneity. And like all good things everywhere, it's through struggle, right? It was the summer and the fall of 2020, um, COVID was, had descended and people were still in the street demanding justice on lots of different fronts, but in particular in response to the murder of George Floyd. When I think faculty and staff and students on campus decided that at some point we just had to stop and say enough is enough, right? It is 2020 and the University of Chicago had never had a department devoted to the study of race. No African-American studies, no ethnic and race studies, a department, right? So even though those programs and departments come established in late 60s, early 70s, right? Doesn't exist formally on this campus. And to not have something designated in a, in a formal discipline at this university is to mean that it doesn't really matter, right? And I think we decided that, in fact, as a group, we had to come together and make some demands, understanding our position as laborers. I want to be very clear about that, because we only often talk about faculty as labor, but that is what we are. Um, and what we said was, we love our students, so we will teach our courses, but we will not participate in any other service for the university. And you won't be able to use our pictures and our research to, to talk about diversity and inclusion like y'all always like to do, right, without, in fact, committing the resources. So we made five, I dare say, demands. Um, and one was the development of a new department of critical race studies that has now developed into what we call race, diaspora, and indigeneity. I, I want to, uh, yay, yay, that's right. I, I want to be clear that along the way, there were administrators who were supportive, right? Because in fact, we now have a commitment of 13 lines, 13 faculty lines, right, for the new department, I know. <laughs> 
See, people here are like, what? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes Y'all yes. been at this a long time, Thank so I, I was happy to I hear know, that. You wait long enough, they'll give you 13, <laughs> right? Like, uh, you can live that long, <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, but I, I want us to, when I think about kind of reimagining the university, at the center of that is struggle, right? Like, nothing gets transformed because, in fact, people say, yeah, that's the right thing to do, even though it is the right thing to do. And I know that on this panel, we're going to talk about struggle and power and even the question of which university, because not all universities are the same. This is an elite university um, and what comes with that eliteness, right? Um, so I just think there are all kinds of possibilities that we are going to be, all of us hopefully, discussing today about what does it mean to reimagine the university? Because in fact, Gina, when you talk about freedoms, and I, I talked to a few people, I was like, why am I having a hard time thinking about freedom at the university? Like, ain't no freedom at the university. There's, you know, supposedly freedom, and Tom, we can talk about the freedom of expression, right? But, um, and it was amazing to me that older faculty like me, who think of themselves as radical and feminist, we're like, and no freedom at a university, right? There are places that we can create where people can engage in what I would call freedom dreaming as a way to think about transformation or what Robin Kelly would have called freedom dreaming, right? As a way to think about how we transform. But that again is about power, it's about struggle, it's about collective action, and it's about understanding this as just one side of struggle or broader project of liberation, so. I'll stop Thank there. you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everyone. That's great. Um, so there's so many threads to pick up here. I think I think um, what I want to start with is um, a, a, an explicit sort of list of the the actual impediments to creating intellectual and physical belonging. So the reason the reason I'm wondering if, if and I'm going to start with you, Eugene. Um, you know, what I'm interested in here is, you know, there's a kind of assumption that there's a statement that all this is going on, it's uncomfortable and it's exclusionary or it's diminishing or it's marginalizing or it's silencing, no argument there. But I'm really interested in us thinking, well, what specifically is it? So, because I, I don't want it to be a boogeyman. I mean, first of all, because it's about how power works to obscure its operation. So I want to bring it into the light to say, okay, what produces this? I mean, obviously, one, I'll just say quickly in case someone's thinking, oh gosh, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, it's, it's the, it's the ever-shifting capacity to exclude in new formations. So we're, it's no longer that they don't admit women, black people, anybody of color, Jews, and any number of other non-Christian white men, right, which is what these schools were for, is that now we include, but we exclude in other ways. We make sure knowledge and source, sources of knowledge uh, and legitimated sources of knowledge keep a racial hierarchy. And that's not only by having Kathy Cohen spend 15 years trying to manage what should have been done every you know it really isn't a big it's not rocket science here i mean and it's not that they couldn't have followed their peers which they often do they always talk to their cohort and they say well our peer group won't do that i'm like well they all did it you know what happened to you you get lost on the way <laughs> but but i think what i'm interested in here is very specifically when you walk around and feel uncomfortable or when you were describing uh, you know stanford and, and your experiences in your community I, I'm interested in classroom, in intellectual, spatial, not so much microaggressions. I'm not asking for a storytelling hour, although I love that. I'm more asking really tangibly, because I think that's where the work is, one of the sites of work for freedom and reimagination. So let's start with you, because you talked a long, long time ago, poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, there's a, is my mic still on? Is it, okay, good. Um, that, oh, there's a lot of things I'm thinking about but um, let me talk, this is related to what you were saying about legitimate knowledge and uh, earlier Gina was talking about, you know, there's never enough data. Um, one thing that I've come across is um, methodology, methods. Like that is where I have, you're right, yeah. I think that's a really major way that, um, the, a major impediment to this type of freedom dreaming that we've been talking about and that um you know i've i've only i only start, i'm only in year two of my uh tenure track position and so i'm sort of you know new to this and despite that in my you know few years that i've been in this position 
I have received pushback on my methodologies. And when I say I engage, I use community engaged research methodologies and that centers community knowledges, I have had people in power telling me, do they really know what they want? Do they, do they really know best what they need? Right, and um, if that's a methodology, then what are you as a researcher even doing? Are, does that just mean that you're reporting on what they want and not actually critically engaging it, right? So I've had these kinds of questions about the validity um, and the rigor and the trustworthiness of my methodology. Um, and that really is just a proxy of uh, questioning the validity of people's lived experiences and the theories and um, ways of knowing that they have developed through their lives battling uh, oppression, right? Um, and in all of their complicated encounters with power. And so, um, you know, it's not all, it's not even only that there's never enough data because it's like, how much research do you need to know? <laughs> how much research do we have to conduct to prove that like structural racism is real and that affects people's lives um, and their opportunities? But it's also, it's not only that there isn't enough data, it's that the methods that we use to um, uplift, that is always in question as well. And that's not even just because I do community or qualitative research. I've seen that happen with um, folks who engage with uh, quant crit, what's known as quant crit as well, right? Like quantitative um, analysis with a CRT lens. And so um, that, that's, a, that's a big one that I have encountered recently. Um, yeah, and I also want to know, again, as a junior faculty, another way that, uh, another sort of impediment to this uh, reimagining the university is uh, the evaluation of our work. Um, and, <laughs> you know, do we get evaluators who, uh, who, who know this work, who, who actually are capable of evaluating the type of um, this community engaged research or research for um, you know, re re uh, activist research or engaged research, or whatever you want to call it, um, are the folks being asked to evaluate us during reappointment or during tenure? Like, do they, are they familiar with that work? Are they able to actually evaluate it in, on those terms? And so um, thinking about evaluation is also something that's on my mind as, you know, someone who's on tenure. Right, and just, to, just to, and then Lisa, I'm going to immediately go to you, but um, you know, one of the, the sort of subtle details of what you're describing is that the hierarchies of who's the most important in the field, who would know who's who, is understood as a racially neutral figure and a gender neutral figure and, and so on. So when they say, well, if Bob Jackson doesn't know your work, then I mean, who? So the idea that there's a whole network of geniuses wandering around around Bob, ignoring him. Hey, Bob, you know, and then they go and they go to the other rooms in the conference. <clears throat> he doesn't know. So then it becomes a threat to his knowledge base to even, you know, recommend other people. So you're defending your work, right? Trying to find the right framework and structure to understand it. And, and it all looks like an objective matter of status and an objective matter of productivity. So, I mean, that's a really, both parts were great examples, methodology and this, but just wanted to break it out a little bit more for those who haven't been tortured by the university. <laughs> and, this, <laughs> and I haven't taken that role. Go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> no, I, I think, uh, wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say a, a man. I'm a non-religious person, but I'm gonna say amen to all of that. <laughs> and um, just say, you know, not only methods, but the field of study um, that, uh, I think at a lot of I don't I don't know what other schools are like, but but at Brown I think econ computer science and I forgot what the third one on or the three philosophy biggest, is it philosophy economics philosophy economics and computer science I think are the three most popular and not, not philosophy for popular majors computer science, computer science economics and political science political science okay so those are the the kind of big three that that students go in or. I don't know why they wind up there. Okay, I'll, I'll say that. My small cohort of advisees, you know, I think they um, have the misperception that in order to get a job, you need a degree in business or economics and computer science and then political science. Those people are kind of like the outliers, like, whoa. Um, but when I taught at Michigan State University, it was very much the same thing. Like, unless I have a degree in business, how can I get a job? And that, to me, says so much about like the limitations of our imaginations and our thinking and the bad information that undergrads have about um, what the possibilities are in the world for them or even how one becomes an expert in something or gets a job in some cases. I mean, um, 
yeah, if they only knew the circuitous path that has landed me here, boy, <laughs> they would be shocked. Um, but I do try and tell them that. But it's um, that kind of um, emphasis on valuation of certain disciplines, disciplinary ways of knowing, um, and on, on objects uh, has definitely been an impediment. I think in many cases, I, as a theater artist, have to continuously um, you know, justify the creative work that I do and write about it in addition to doing the show, which is hard. I mean, I'm excited to write about it. I would really love if other people wrote about it because I don't have the same kind of assistant critical lens upon my, my work. But, you know, this is, this is what I signed up for, so I'm doing it, which means I have not only the capacity to write about my work critically, but also to make the stuff. So I'm a triple threat or maybe quadruple at that point. But um, I think one of the challenges of students, though, and we're, I'm in Africana studies, is that not only is people, people have, so we have so many misperceptions about what the role of the arts is in society. People are like, like the, the water fish issue, like everybody got culture, why do we need to study culture? <laughs> or the, you know, I love my black students, this is universally, but you know, I'm black, why do I need to study blackness? And, you know, unfortunately, along with the kind of narrative about black studies is the limited notion that it only emerged out of black student protest in the 1960s, which is such an egregious erasure of the study of black history life um, from the beginning of time since, come on, Africa, the beginning of humankind, the beginning, all the roots of all the things, Africa. Um, but because I, we, uh, the university and the students who apply and enter, uh, the colleagues who are formed around um, those processes of evaluation, um, have these uh, carry these knowledge systems and values with them. To um, to challenge them means to have to constantly show up in, in new ways, and that is hard all the time. Um, I think also that that along with that kind of um, there's an emphasis often on conscription, on hurry on um, bigger, faster, funnier, on, <laughs> on um, more grants, more money, more students instead of depth. There's a big emphasis on um, product over process. I guess that's my shorthand for that. And Gina, you mentioned this. Um, and you know, the, uh, to make art is to be engaged in a slow and thoughtful process of very deep learning. It's the kind of learning that no, and I mean, no, they may not remember exactly the name of the play, but I'm talking to Brown alumni right now who are in shows in the 1960s, and they are not only re reminded of like the show, but the lines and really the relationships that they form and how important that work was to them in the moment. Um, the arts are the place where people create those shields and spaces, not safe, but safe spaces in which they're able to enter into the world and feel affirmed in their knowledge systems. And that kind of way, uh, knowledge is often devalued, even within disciplines like English, that are allegedly about you know the study of of culture, but um, the doing of the the doing of the work is um, often relegated. There's these divisions within departments, like oh, you all make the art and we do the history theory, and I don't under I don't understand that personally. <laughs> those divisions. Um, I will say, talking about evaluation though, at my former institution, they straight up had this white woman who I know is a racist, set up to evaluate my work and my dean was shocked, his head popped off the day I said, no, she's on my list of the people who absolutely cannot. And then he had to, you know, figure something out. <laughs> I guess he should have read your list <laughs> earlier. That's amazing. Go ahead. Zelda. All right, yeah, we're just going to go down the row for here, and then we're going to do one or two questions per person. Um, well, I'll, I'll be brief, but but what really isn't an impediment to this to this work, right? The university presents, um, you know, we receive no direct funding, or we we receive a very. I used to go around saying we receive not a penny from the university, and and now um, they've given us some money, so that I don't say that anymore. <laughs> but it's not very much. Um, funding this program is a huge impediment. We've been fighting for years for onload teaching, right? So that it's not an overload for faculty who are, you know, faculty like the ones you see who are teaching on top of their 
actual normal job and commitments to uh, the university campus, uh, universities will see teaching in prison as a sort of, oh, volunteer or it's separate service. work. It's service, service. exactly. It's not real teaching, quote unquote. So this year we actually just finally um, one onload teaching very one course per semester we've expanded our program so we're offering you know basically somewhere around 14 classes per semester and one of those is funded through an onload teaching um, spot for non-campus faculty but that's a huge win for us right yeah. uh Zelda, the thing the thing i was and then we're going to yeah. go to kathy the thing the thing that i really loved about what you said first which partly prompted my question was this very sort of kind obfuscation Right. Maybe. I mean, I always I was just joking to one of the speakers who I met on, in an Uber on the way over here. Uh, and I said, you know, it's uh, I, in some ways I, I sort of fondly recall the old days when people would just tell you straight out, you know, we're not teaching that BS or, you know, whatever it is. You're like, oh, good. I'm glad we didn't have to go through 14 weeks of thank you. Thank you. You know, and all this nonsense where they're not saying what they really mean, right? And so that's just so exhausting because you're not even sure which one means what. Anyway, that's what I was, it was such a perfect example of there's no one in charge, there's somebody who's bigger than me. I wish I could do it, Zelda, but you know, we just can't. So anyway, that's very powerful because if you get angry, now who's gotten angry, right? Who's who's been difficult? Just you. Go ahead, Kathy. What what, what comes to mind for you? And then well, we'll... I, I'm not even sure I'm I remember the question, so I'm just going to say what I want to say. I want to say what I mean. You heard well, that right. It, you know, you, <laughs> here's what I, I want us to make sure that we don't lose sight. So one of the things that I worry about is That's a good question. The distinction well, what are the things between, you worry about? Okay. Uh, I, I, there you go. So many things. The, the distinction between like an obsession with inclusion and not a focus on power, right? And and I think I even think about that with RDI, right? RDI is an important. The new department is an important site but it can allow the university to function, right? Without That's transformation right. and without challenge. And the real power people, and we all know this, is not RDI or the dean, it's the board of trustees, right? Or the fact that the president of this university has never been a person of color, never been a black woman, ain't probably never gonna be a black woman, right? Like if we don't have a clear sense of where power exists and operates at these institutions, we will spend a lot of time, and these are all good things, hiring more and more junior faculty of color who ain't got no power, right, but who diversify the classroom. And so the question becomes, how do we in fact think about transformation, right, and make power legible at these institutions? Right, and I, I, I just think we have to think about, and the last thing, I, I know I got, no, thank you, I hear, I hear I see you down there, Tricia. Oh, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I was just saying yeah. amen in my language. You okay, know. I hear you, um, which is to also, the Varian Baldwin reminds us to think complex, think in complex ways about what's the university, right? We can spend a lot of time thinking about what we do in the classroom, and we should, but we also have to remember that these universities own real estate, Right, they produce, you know, they have medical centers, right? And you have to fight to get a trauma center at the University of Chicago, yeah. right? And at the University of Chicago, we have the third largest police force in the state of Illinois, yeah. right? So when we say transformation of the university, what parts of the university are we trying to transform? And part of it undoubtedly has to be about pedagogy and departments but it also has to be attached to a very clear sense of where is the power in the university. And if you look at boards, they are the widest part of the university. Right, right. So let me let me push you a little bit. I'm with you 100%, push, but I want to push, for push entertainment always, yeah. purposes. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, you're saying power. What if we said sort of political um, positions? Because you can have a whole lot of black folk, a whole lot of women, a whole lot of all kinds of categories we could throw up in, the, in all kinds of high positions. And I could tell them I did my milk toast peeps, you know, they're just like, oh, right. okay, you're just going along with the flow. Right. So it's it's a body. Yes. And you know, I does, think, okay, that's go right. ahead. That's that's just, right. No, no, no. We're, we're in the same that. place. Right. I'm not suggesting that in fact demographics or representation equal political solidarity. Right. Not at right. all. Or, or progressive right. or, or particular oh, not, politics. Not at all. I'm right. saying that that is one way for us to begin to enter into a discussion about what is it we want and where is that power located. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, I was so just pushing along because I hear you. Because I think one of the things that is is easy to forget 
is that we have in many fields a pretty decent amount of diversity at some schools and no intellectual transformation of the disciplines and no challenges to the fundamental ideas that elite universities. And I would say that in many ways, uh, and we should stop because then uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah. that like that you, departments, oh, departments, me. right? Departments have a uh, back and yeah. forth on this, right? I'm so learning departments a lot. Are like, no, we don't want you to go. But okay, if you're going to go and then let us have all of our lines and decide who we're going to hire, that's a win-win for us, right? Because the students that we recruit that want to study race, we'll send them over to RDI also, and we'll keep a few folks of color in our department. But the majority of the discipline will continue to be primarily white and male, right? And we'll have a certain type of very, Research very limited understanding of what methods and the questions and the subjects and the people who are worth study are. And, and so that's the concern about when we have a strategy of diversity, does it transform power at all? And I think quite often it does not. No, right, exactly. And that's what I was really trying to get at. Like, how do we create these challenges um, in, in this process? So I want to move to freedom quickly. And I'm going to address this question to uh, Ejen and uh, Lisa. OK, the two of oh, this, then we'll come back down there. So you know, Kelly's work, Freedom Dreams, um, refers very much to the imaginary spaces and expressive performances and ways of being that black and queer and female and all kinds of other sort of black related uh, groups uh, have come up with to manage the sense of containment, control, and erasure. Um, now, on this, uh, here in the academic environment, you know, even with all of this, we do have an amazing amount of relative labor-based freedom. Come, you know, not too many people have the kind of you know perks that the old school university framework has. I don't think this is going to continue forever, but right now we have that. So my question is, how do you enact freedom in your life, either intellectually, spiritually, and otherwise? in the context of your work here. I mean, I, you can tell me what you do on Sunday also, but what, I, what I'm really asking is, what do you do intellectually? Does it mean the way you talk to people, who you talk to, how you try to interrupt, or how you stay silent? I had a grad student once tell me, all this resisting a feminist, the black feminist, all this resisting, I'm just going to be quiet. At first, I was like, you can't. Now I'm like, you know, that was really, that was kind of hip. <laughs> I should have taken her up on that, right? This, like, so there's a lot of ways to do this. Lisa, why don't you hit us off and then we'll come to you, Eugen. That was a big question, and I, I knew it was coming, but <laughs> I gave you I gave you warning. You did give me give me warning. Okay, and this doesn't. I guess one of the things I'm going to do right now is say that I'm going to resist the a feeling like I have to be perfect, um, and I I try to communicate that to to students. I'm very uh, uh, in my classrooms. Um, something that actually I began to do, just as one example, this semester, which I've never done before, but I've been really, um, I'm, I mean, I'm deeply influenced by my, my work on healing. And I've been thinking a lot about how do you build capacious, a sense of capaciousness and openness and capacity. Um, and so something that I've started doing is every day at the beginning of class, we take a moment for pause and kind of like what Gina did, uh, uh, be it breaths, or a moment of silence, or uh, the other day, since we were reading a play, and my uh, my class is called "What's Poppin'," the Contemporary Black Theater Workshop, and uh, we were reading a hip hop play, and so I said, "Have y'all ever done a cipher? Let's do one right now." And so we did like a sounding cipher uh, in order to transition from whatever they were doing before to the work together. And um, I don't know how they feel about it, but I told them the very first day that I was going to try this because. I don't like running to class feeling like this. I don't, I don't need that. And um, I did ask a few of them in the beginning, you know, um, how they felt before we did the moment of stillness and silence and how they felt after. And it's, it's time for a new check-in definitely with them because we're about midterm. But the sense of ease is what I'm looking for in a classroom. It is not the way that I was trained in theater or in performance studies or in black studies. But I refuse to pass on the kind of negative practices that I was taught. And I'm not trying to disparage you know, the teachers that I had. They did their work and I appreciate them. But I know for myself, I don't want to, we're already like this. 
And I don't need to practice that in a classroom. I don't think it encourages capaciousness. I think a constriction, rigid thinking, closed-mindedness are all symbols of white supremacy culture. Yeah, good example. Thank you. Definitely. That was, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that was excellent. I'm going to follow your example. I'm going to give myself permission to give you what I feel is an incomplete, still in process answer. Um, you know, when I initially saw the conference theme and thought about this question, I felt a real resistance to the word freedom because of the kind of time in which, um, so throughout my formative years, you know, post 9-11, the word freedom really became just another word for like American jingoism. And it was, so I think in my mind, the word freedom is, is, is associated with something very individualistic, very uncaring very um, kind of dichotomous, like you're with us or against us um, type of thing. And some of that rhetoric is actually very relevant today to this particular moment. Um, and so I had to think about how to redefine freedom for myself in order to answer this question. And, um, and it's, you know, thinking about what does it mean to enact freedom intellectually? Um, and so thinking about both my research and in my classroom, um, I, I think of freedom as safety, and I think of freedom as something, how, how can I redefine freedom as something about like, like more collective and structural rather than so individualistic? And so some of that, the way that I try to enact that it, for me is um, a refusal to allow institutions to tell, to define um, what's valuable um, and what matters and what counts as productive and really uh, and, and refusing those definitions and instead insisting to center the way that um, myself, my community, my loved ones think about value and um, quote unquote productivity and safety and community and things like that. And so for me, that has meant constantly reminding myself that I may be, the work that I do may have brought me into this institution or into this field of this thing that we call, I mean, it's really an industry that we call academia, um, but the work that I do, the values that I hold are outside of that and, um, and sort of trying to hold, center that um, even as uh, these forces really try to say like, no, no, you should be, only our values matter, only our metrics matter. And so that kind of refusal, I think, is one way that I enact freedom for myself and for my students too, right? Because students, I mean, maybe you all know, like students come in and they're like, I need to start a research project right away. I need to start learning how to do research right away. And I'm like, please take a breath and like, look at, and just like read and like listen and learn from your classmates and like, look, you know, that, that stuff will come later, right? And that's because they feel really like pressured to do that in this environment. But anyways, so that refusal and also like as much as I can giving myself and others, as in those who I work with or my students um, and those folks in my life, um, both time and the grace to like mess up and try again. Um, that to me is, you know, that to me is freedom, right? Is that you get to mess up, right. that you get to take your time, that you get you to say, I'm still learning. Um, and that's something that, that's another way that I'm trying to enact this intellectual freedom as right. well. Um, I just want to add something to this. Um, I think this is, these are both such great answers. Um, there's so much that has changed about um, the level of anxiety that students have bringing into the classroom. And I'm not sure, and I mean all different backgrounds, I don't, it, no, and no group is immune in my opinion, everybody's completely worked up. And, and I think that some of that anxiety is related to the kind of um, hegemony of status hierarchy as something you have to constantly earn. It's almost the, the, um, the fusion of celebrity right and the sort of if you're, you're just as popular as you were you know six weeks ago if you if you don't have something new you, you know you're in trouble and it has to be more extreme than whatever you did before you marry that with sort of hierarchy and in the academy and you get this i have to be the top in the field i have to be the best this one or the other and they're like 19 
you know. Um, and so, I mean, it's like, just take, slow your roll, you know, <laughs> let's just hang on. But what I think is so interesting and important about it is not only that it can reduce people's sense of freedom, but I think it directly reduces our ability to develop other kinds of methods and other kinds of research questions and other kinds of foci of projects because we're terrified of not being on the, we're terrified of being on the margins in some way. Um, and so when you say that you want to make sure you have multiple value systems, I, I see that as very important for establishing freedom, not only from the university as it stands, but the intellectual containment that it requires. So I'm going to tell a very quick story, and then the next question is coming down to you two, okay? Let me tell you what the question is now, I'll give you a little warm up. Um, um, so when are you the most hopeful? about these freedoms, right? When, when do you feel the greatest sense of openings, right? And, and how can we make them bigger and, and support them? Okay, before we get on to that, I gotta tell you this story. So I, I wrote the first full-length dissertation on hip hop. Um, and as a million years ago, 30 years ago, it came out. Um, it's called Black Noise. And the reason I'm telling you this story is that I went to Brown as a PhD student. I went undergrad at Yale, Zelda. So I know this, you know, Yale, you never, never mind. Um, and the thing is that everyone said to me, you cannot write your dissertation on this. You cannot write your dissertation. You will have nowhere to get a job. You will be the laughing stock of God knows who. And, uh, you know, they kept telling me that. And, I, and this is what, what, how I framed it. And it's going to sound absurd, but I said it every week when they said this to me. I said, look, I went to Yale. I take the LSAS. I go make $500,000 a year. I got that choice. Y'all won't let me do it. I'll just do it the regular rich people's way. I don't want to. I like my summers free to think and read and write, but I don't have no options. In fact, you're my la you're, you're not even my best option, actually. <laughs> um, and so there's that. And then the other thing was, I'm not doing this work to please anybody. I'm not doing it to fight with them, but I'm not doing it to please them. So everyone would send me to new people. I was like the child they kept sending around to relatives. So you, maybe you can work with them, honey, because I can't. <laughs> He don't listen to me. It was like that. They sent me to the music department, which was a grave error. <laughs> and uh, so as he's telling me how this is not actually music and that I didn't understand what music was, somebody blaring LL Cool J goes riding right by this man's office. <laughs> oh my, I mean, and he was, this was like, car, like as if we were on the West Coast, like, you know, for real car. So I just waited. <laughs> he was all I was like, so what was your, you finish your point about, you know, <laughs> anyway, so it was a constant battle. But for me, it was really about knowing why I was doing what I was doing. Because when you're not sure about that, and you don't have to be sure, but when you're not confident about figuring that out on your own without listening to some other people's views, it's very difficult to stay confident. It's very difficult to, you know, hold on to the values that are outside the university. So. Um, and, and so just keeping, you know, keeping in mind the creativity that's possible when you hold on to that. Okay, so on the positive side, moving down the line, I'm going to start with Kathy and Zelda. Yeah, oh, sorry, Kathy, you ready? You're ready. always ready. Red, red to go. <laughs> red to yes. go. Uh, what was the, no, yeah, the question? The question was, when, 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 when are you most hopeful? And I actually have an answer, which okay. is, uh, to your question, it was when I'm in a formation of collective resistance. And, and what I mean by that, I mean, when we came together as a collectivity to demand an RDI, that's when I felt most free. When I'm working with Alice and others and PNAP around our Stateville course, that's when I feel most free. When I'm working with young activists from BYP 100 and others to reimagine what research could look like both in and outside the university that is in fact meaningful, that is when I feel the most free. Again, it goes back to, you know, who are my people? My people are always in struggle, whether I'm working with Tracy, who I've known forever, Tracy Matthews, or others here that are on campus and others that are off campus. It is the work of expanding the university to let folks in and to have all of us transform. To me, that's the, that's the places and the times when I feel like I feel free and I feel like I can breathe. Excellent, that's yeah. a beautiful answer. You were ready for that one. You, you were ready. Zelda, go ahead. I, I'm not as ready, but I, um, 
Maybe I'll take a moment to express okay. my gratitude for okay. being on this panel. I, I feel like I'm learning. I'm just thinking and learning so much. It's really kind of incredible to be up here with these folks. Um, the times I'm most hopeful, I guess, you know, you would imagine it might be these little wins that we have. These like, oh, we got the onload teaching. Oh, we got the, you know, a little bit of funding. Um, the times that I, I feel most hopeful are when I remember that this program isn't about us or the wins, it's about the investments in who we believe to be the future leaders and citizens, right, of the university. I, we see this program as in line, mm -hmm. for better or for worse, with the university mission at Yale, which is to seek extraordinarily promising students from all over the world and to educate them with the aim of creating future leaders and citizens, right? And the question is, who do you believe those future leaders and citizens are? And for me, when I when we have formerly incarcerated students, when we have fellows, and when like, you know, I'm pulled into something or I'm asked something and I say, don't ask me, ask, ask our student, you know, our, putting our students into positions of power, positions of leadership, that is, and, and seeing them respected on campus and seeing them consulted, you know, and utilized for work that's about mass incarceration, but maybe hasn't actually, <laughs> actually, you know, thought to ask people with direct experience what they should be, you know, right? Work that's about people, but without consulting the people who are most impacted. Um, bringing those people into the forefront, bringing our students to the forefront of the conversations, that's when I feel hopeful and recognized that the program is being recognized. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. I mean, just what you were describing, so many students transferring prisons to go to get into a class. I mean, you would think this would be the best rehab in the world. They would just say, here, have some education. But apparently, the absence of education is, is a political goal, right? And, and so there's no other reason to withhold education, given how expensive prison is. And people are willing to teach it for free, pretty much, right? Many, many people are. And they don't, they don't want that kind of radical learning about who you are, right, in the world. Um, so I have I have a question that is a little bit it's a little it's a little bit inside baseball so forgive me but um, so it is entirely true Lisa I'm going to quote some people and then then it's open I'll take any two people for the oh, you, you, wake up I'll be right <laughs> she's like she's like oh good ready. Ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay look, okay so you were you were mentioning how how egregious it is to think about the beginning of of sort of black studies or Chicano studies and so on and so forth as starting in the 60s with the radical social movements of that era and that this whole history goes back not only all the way I mean obviously all the way back but even just a hundred years earlier there's a whole infrastructure um and Kathy, you were talking about the new department and the, the you know, both the getting the lines and so on and so forth. So I have a question, though, and this is mo mostly directed to the two of you, but I think it applies to your work, too. Maybe not you so much, Zelda, so forgive me. But I, I think that I worry that there's a, a kind of, are we, oh, we are, oh, here we go, um, a kind of internalization of the distance and remove and hyper theorization that depletes the capacity for people to humanize black and brown subjects in in intellectual work that is to say that that theory without grounded knowledge theoretical frameworks because you know i mean i'm a cultural studies scholar we're always dealing with theory but not outside of material conditions not outside of the circumstance so one of the things i worry about is a kind of internal takeover a kind of internal takeover that says well if you do work like this and you, you know, black people are some sort of, I don't know where they are, they're just sort of floating out there somewhere, right, then you'll be more highly valued than the people who actually hear what the people are saying, uh, and who want to ask more concrete material questions. So, you know, I guess I, one of the things I worry about is how much that has become the norm that the impossibility of, of radical change is actually at the heart of a lot of theorization that I worry about being a freedom impediment. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and a way to help us think our way out of social change. So Kathy, you look like you know exactly what I'm trying to say here. Well, I, I think we are thinking the same thing, but you'll tell me if I'm wrong. No, and, you won't uh, be wrong. And, I could be wrong, definitely. Um, because I also worry, and I, and I'll, you know, we're, we're among family, so to speak, I know. Uh, I worried about RDI, right? Race, diaspora, and indigeneity. And there was a back and forth between should we 
focus and fight for a black studies program. We are on the south side of Chicago. Those are the commitments that are most proximate. The largest number of scholars that will move into the new department are scholars of black studies. And I worried, and I, I'm not just me, I think we all did, all of us who were working on this understood the compromise, and I'll say compromise, in getting something passed at the University of Chicago as having to be framed as distinct and new and theoretical. Um, and all the people of color are somewhere else. Well, okay, so, but here's the thing. No, 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 so yeah, yes, that could be it. But I will say what I am most proud, well, not most, many, there are many things that make me proud to be a part of this new department. One is the deep commitment to saying that what we want to do is to be a transformative department that is public facing, that has deep commitments to South Side of Chicago and to indigenous communities, right? To be thinking about who are the different types of students that have to populate our courses. So yes, Alice and I teach a mixed enrollment course at Stateville. Eve Ewing is going to teach an Afrofuturism course that's going to be mixed enrollment, meaning half the students will be from folks on the south side of Chicago, right? That we are trying to engage in a different type of pedagogy that says we are not just going to study black people. Black people are going to be not just black students, but all kinds of folks are going to be in the classroom helping us re-theorize, re-imagine, right? how we think about questions of race, diaspora, and indigeneity. So I think it's very real to say, be careful about kind of uh, the theorization of a kind of new framework around race without centering people in their material condition. But I will say, I think that is our commitment as a department. And the last thing I'll say is to that point, we are also establishing what we call the accountability committee, which will include faculty, staff, students, and community members. And what we are asking of that committee is get in our face and hold us accountable, right? Tell us, in fact, if we are meeting our mission or if we're falling short, and let's think about how we can do better. Yeah, that's great, yeah, because you can get distracted just trying to keep up with your every day, yeah, which, yeah, definitely, go ahead. I don't think I have anything to contribute. Okay, all right, all right, well, I mean, Straight up, I love that. I love that that the model that you have articulated, and I think, um, I mean, at Brown, definitely, the Africana Studies Department is, I think, in keeping with other Black Studies departments, in that it it refuses to abandon the community, but it is hard. At the same time, I mean, Brown is literally on a hill, and they, um, you know, took that land from the indigenous people, and then over time, in collaboration with city uh, planners and private corporations have have eliminated the black communities that were directly to the north and directly to the south. So if crossing the river and going up the hill wasn't hard enough, you know, the people have just, they've just straight up been largely eliminated. They've been moved. Um, folks are still there, but um, the kind of vibrancy that in the 1960s and 1940s and 1920s, that a very admittedly very small black and brown population in the city had is it's even in some ways harder to connect with people. And so we I think necessarily have to keep refusing the, the schisms that, um, that come with how the university has managed its space, its sense of space in, uh, in order to create a, a perception of safety for a particular kind of student. Definitely, definitely. All right, so we're going to move on. We're going to bring you all into the conversation. We have plenty of time, so you can all have quite a bit of, you know, statements from the crowd slash questions. Are there microphones for our audience so they can be recorded? Um, so I don't know what the plan is. Do you have a plan where they should go? Should they stand somewhere? Oh, okay, great. Any questions, comments, hands up? Hands up. First row. Oh, oh. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Monica. I'm a PhD student here at Crown. Um, and I just want to say it's been really refreshing to hear you all. So thanks for coming and doing this panel. Um, so there's a lot of talk about like locations of power in the institution and how intentional it is that there are so many layers and the removal so that it's hard to pinpoint any sort of accountability. Um, and also, 
as PhD students, we're learning how to navigate these institutions, how to succeed in these institutions. Um, and so many of us come in really excited. Um, and I am just about to start really dissertating and I'm already quite jaded. And I'm curious, what would your advice be or feedback be for, feedback be for PhD students who want to engage in this work and also still need to survive in these institutions that are intentionally trying to make us conform in a way so that we're not problematic faculty for them later? Um, I'll take it. I'll, t I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm the cleanup. I'm the cleanup woman. <laughs> No, I mean, listen, so I mean, so here's here's a, a shocking, horrible truth. There are very few jobs with your level of talent that would not also make that same demand. So the really important thing to remember is that it's not just happening in the academy. We talk about it there because that's where we happen to spend far too much of our time. But, you know, you, you there are many really amazing places in law and medicine and so on and so forth who you would have to do that work for. I'm saying that not to tell you there's nowhere to go and there's no way out, <clears throat> which is kind of what it sounded like. But, but what I am saying is that that's what we have to learn how to navigate. To me, that's one of the places of protection that enables healing, right? If you can't protect yourself from that kind of experience through whatever mechanisms you and your friends and colleagues and family members and you know, churches or synagogues or whatever your family does, um, all of that is really gonna be important right, in order for you to keep a little bit of it at distance, right, and that's a strategy, whatever your strategy is, I would work on that, rather than thinking about this place and what it's doing, unless those information is going to help you better refine your strategy. Does that make sense? Um, the reason why I'm saying that too is because <clears throat> figuring out how to do this job means figuring that out. We, I don't want you to be 50 and half out your mind, you know what I mean, because <laughs> That option is possible. I've seen it. You know, I mean, it can happen. Um, and people get sick, really, really, really sick. A lot of black women get very, very sick. Um, and so that, that's what I'm really doing there, even though it sounds a little bit like I'm saying the opposite. Um, but, and just one last thing look, you do the work you want to do. Don't just do the work you want to do. Your people will find you, they will find you. It doesn't matter. So, you, and stop thinking about Harvard. <laughs> Everybody just stop thinking, you know, so it's like, I'm like, if I hear one more student tell me about Harvard, I'm like, have you really visited the place? I mean, you know, Chicago's another story, but, you know, just stop, don't even get into that. Do the work you love, because you can't be jaded about the ideas. The ideas are what you bring into them, right? So that's where your love and energy should go. So then they're just out there. Does that, anyway, I hope that helps. It's a really good question. I think there were another person at your table, and then there's two here, and okay, one, two, oh, we got five. Here she is. Okay, great. And then we're going to come over here. Hello. Um, I am a, actually, I'm a Southside resident, actually, at the moment. Um, but I'm here on work time as well as a police accountability organizer. But in my free time, I serve on the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. So my question is coming from that place. And when it comes to um, race and our indigenousness and even coming back to reclaim or fully repair mm -hmm. a debt that is owed, um, what does you, Chicago, see its responsibility is in that? Um, and do you see institutions, and not just you, Chicago, I just said that because we're here. I know there's other people in the room. But um, do you see the reparations movement having a direct connection to our institutions? Um, and that these institutions could be leaders in that movement to help sustain it for a long-term permanent thing and not just kind of what you said as a siloed project that is only for a few people who need some help, you know, right. the poor, people, poor black folk that just can't get up off the oppression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just stop mentioning it, it'll go away, right? Um, anybody up here want to uh, Miss Kathy? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I can tell by what my like, panelists you know, I'm do. They were like, <laughs> like, they had turned off my mic, like, uh oh. <laughs> now, well, first, I would never speak for the University of Chicago, and I'm sure the University of Chicago is glad of that. that uh, <laughs> but I will say that I want to, I want to go back to say, the more than diversity group that came together 
that led in part to RDI, they made five demands. One was about kind of policing, one was about the department, one was about the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture and uh, autonomy and their budget, but another one was about what we call the Truth Commission, and I think now it has a different long title, which was about establishing a commission, I hope me, you're gonna be like, who cares about a commission, but a commission to look at the his, history of the University of Chicago's relationship to, in particular, the South Side of Chicago, right? So there are, there have been commissions that looked at kind of a university's relationship to slavery, but we said, no, 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 not just slavery, Right, we're talking about urban renewal, we're talking about Jim Crow, we're talking about all of that, as I think I would argue a factual basis for the claims about reparations, right, to understand it in multiple stages. So I, I think that's a real, and we know that there were graduate students who did a report on the university's relationship to slavery uh, and the idea of reparations. So I don't think it's outlandish or ridiculous or anything to be thinking about what institutions like the University of Chicago owe to Proxima communities, right, where they have taken resources and established, you know, buildings and houses and all of those things. So that's part of what we're trying to do in terms of the demands that we're making of the university. That's great. Thank you. It's, you could, I think this, this woman here in the front, I can't see your name tag, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, hi, how are you? Okay, I just met you, I'm so terrible. Here, yes, 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 she's our next. Hi, my name is Yifa Thurman and I'm a Northside resident and also an artist. Um, I focus on African American um, work in my, in my own family's history of escape from slavery. But I'm actually curious about um, your work um, and with Asian families in the university and this idea of the silent, um, minority, is that how you pronounce, how you say it, the silent model, model minority, and also sort of, are, is this encompassing all Asians from everywhere, and how does that work within the university setting with um, race and freedom, and this idea sometimes of maybe not being connected to a person of color, uh, or how do you navigate, how do the families navigate all of that within the university setting? Yeah, thank you for that question, Aoife. Um, so it's actually interesting that you asked that because as I was sitting here on this panel, I started thinking um, the projects that I introduced, you know, uh, the GBG committee, um, they're really outside of the university. I actually, like, I haven't written about that work. And at this moment, at least, I, um, I refuse to publish on that work because I, um, don't want to write about it in a way that's like I've like, what is it that you do with clay? Mold. Um, that I've molded it to fit into um, kind of what uh, convention, yeah, conventional understanding of this project because I think right now I don't necessarily have the tools to talk about it in a way that resists that effectively. So I'm still sort of sitting on it and thinking about it as um, my community work. Um, and so, it, that project's relationship with the university, that project's relationship with my sort of job as a faculty is actually very complicated and sort of still forming, I think. But I can tell you a little bit more about the work itself since I think I promised I would do that um, earlier on. But this, um, this project or the GBG began out of conversations between myself and um, In Ha Choi, who's the executive director at HANA Center. And we have, we had these really long conversations about what it means to be Asian American who's committed to racial justice and um, to be studying issues of race and racialization and thinking about what it means to be like have Asian Americanness be weaponized to protect white supremacy and how do we push back against that in a sustainable way. And we realized, like, we can't be the only people. <laughs> we cannot be the only Korean Americans. Which, we're obviously not the only Korean Americans in Chicago thinking about this. So, but our mission really was not to just bring together folks who are already thinking about this. We wanted to think about the folks who are kind of curious about it or ambivalent or want to know, but they don't have a space to go and, like, ask those questions and to really do that learning. So, for example, thinking about like first generation Korean uh, immigrants who 
they didn't have school. Well, okay, even if you have schooling in the U.S., you don't really learn um, really great history. Um, <laughs> so I won't say that. But you know, they didn't have this kind of learning opportunity to, to learn about the extensive history of enslavement, of dispossession, right? Um, and so their understanding when they come into the U.S., they have a really different. Um, I don't know what to call it, like perspective or like racial literacy, right? And so then the children that they raise here. And so what we found through our own conversation and through a series of listening sessions with the Korean community around Chicago is that a major, among the things that we heard, um, the thing that was most resonant to folks was that um, Korean American children and young adults wanted to talk with their parents and elders in a meaningful way that wasn't so combative and wasn't so much like you don't understand, no, you don't understand that kind of thing, right? Um, because there's so much love for each other. There's so much love for each other. And yet they're not really talking with the same language, both figuratively and literally, because you know, when you come here, your language is taken away from you, right? Or if you're born here, your the language is taken away from you. Um, so so we, that's how we created GBG. Like, so it was a really, it, we, we started out thinking it was gonna be about bringing in Korean Americans into um, the movement for racial just, movements for racial justice. And we realized, oh wait, we can't have that without intergenerational healing and conversation. That actually can't exist for Korean Americans without intergenerational, um, the, organiza the organizing has to have an intergenerational component. And so that's sort of how we, came into this um, project. Um, and that process is still ongoing, but it's a really, that's what we call kobuki, like turtle, right? Like it's a very slow unlearning, intergenerational unlearning of um, these white supremacist narratives that say you as Asian Americans are different from other people of color. You all are the model minority. So um, you have earned X, Y, Z, and you deserve X, Y, Z, and those other folks don't. And so like unlearning that um, and learning the, like a critical history of the United States um, and linking that really with the history of the US and Korea as well. And doing that kind of linkage has been really important in our work as well. I don't know if I answered your full question, but. Yeah, that was fantastic. <laughs> And you know what, we all need to be in that class. I think all, the whole country needs a critical unlearning process. So down, I wanna get some hands on the left side. This um, woman in the back with the bracelet. No, were you right there? Yes, yes, you, honey, right, right. And then we'll come around, and gotcha. And then we'll come up here in the front. We'll come back to you, I promise. I just wanna respect the room. So I don't know if it's still morning or afternoon, because this has been awesome. Uh, I just wanna begin by thanking each of you and even uh, the woman who opened this up. I am a new, I'm gonna call myself a student here at UChicago. I am a leadership and society fellow of the Graham School. And so, which is only for people over 50. So I'm an old head here. And uh, you all have given me life this morning um, as I come from elite space of uh, 20 years in philanthropy, 25 years in philanthropy, 20 of which were at the Ford Foundation, and funding studies, uh, at funding social justice, and feeling like I was dying in that place. So when you talk about the water, uh, I sent my child to Yale University and was there when they were turning it upside down in 2020. And so, uh, and my best friend comes from Brown University and uh, in these elite spaces, what you are talking about, <clears throat> white supremacy culture, I just ask to uh, consider a reframing that talks about black joy, black joy is the counter to that, and it, which will help us do that healing that you talk about. And I was a black studies major at the University of Pittsburgh, and then, and then wouldn't put it on my resume uh, when I was trying to get a job. And so I just uh, wanna thank you 
for this uh, gathering. And that was the other thing that I wanted to say. Uh, please gather the intellectuals with the people. Let us be together. Let us be together and, uh, and, and, and look for that black joy to combat that white supremacy culture that is, is water. And I just want to thank you for letting me find my people. I think there's a question over here, and then we're going to swing back over here, and then I'll check. Oh, we got hands up. OK, I'm going to get to you. Okay. I got you. Thanks so much. I echo your sentiments. I feel so much the same. My name is Thais Huntley, and I uh, work here at the booth, and I work in the Rostandi Center. I run a leadership program for nonprofits that serve the black community in the city. And it's new. I've been here a year and a half. And I am like, oh, wow. I'm like writing names. I'm getting the email to you, to you, to you. I'm like, can you come and talk to our groups? But thank you, one. And two, I wanted to ask specifically to Lisa about what you talked about, about healing and what you learned from the women, because I feel so strongly about black women and our health and our healing and us not doing too much and giving too much while still doing all that we do in the community. And so I was really struck by the comment that you made about what you learned from them about healing versus what we do here as a Western society. So I'd love to hear from you on that. Um, okay, so <laughs> the 30, I guess the elevator, I, the hot, the quick take on that is just that, um, you know, was, uh, I spent about 12 years doing ethnographic field work with women who are incarcerated, three sites in the United States, one in Johannesburg, South Africa, two jails and two uh, prisons. And throughout, uh, so these are theater programs for women who are incarcerated. The theater program cannot happen unless the volunteer teaching artists show up. So I accompanied teaching artists uh, who were doing this work in all these different sites. And no, I cannot disclose them because I'm protecting the identities of the incarcerated people because of the significant stigma. But um, uh, one, I will say that one of the sites is in um, northern Chicago land area. It's a jail. Uh, and in, no, it is not Cook County. Um, it's not. It's not Cook County. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I learned through, so I kept encountering this language about theater being healing work. And as a theater kid, I have said that. But I realized that, you know, when thinking about the carceral system, I wasn't, I, when I think about like, how are we gonna change the system? We're we gonna, what are the issues? Can theater end, you know, chronic substance abuse? Can theater end poverty? Can theater, you know, stop domestic violence? Can theater stop sexual assault? Can theater, you know, aid people who have been um, um, overly punished because of their gender nonconformance? Like, what is theater doing in these spaces? And what did I mean by healing? But more importantly, what did they mean? And what I came through, you know, spending so much time with them and listening to um, um, what the theater workshops meant to them, I came to understand that, you know, theater, of, I mean, maybe this is obvious to y'all, but theater is a, a process of self-repair, of self-repair. But it's, it's not one that just counts on, you know, if you break your toe, it's gonna heal. Um, I broke my toe, and when I broke my toe in dance class, I limped over to the nurse who said, yep, you broke your toe, and here's what you need to do. Yes, my body would have healed it, but without her intervention, her, her di affirmation of what I thought, her diagnosis, and then her, um, her skilled assessment of what I needed to do, it would not have healed in a way that um, is true, it is grounded and whole and totally functional, I'm happy to say. I was just dancing in some heels the other day. Um, you know, but, but, um, but my, I tell that story to say that even though I had those experiences of, of healing being a process of self-repair, but one that is dependent upon community to support you, um, not only in diagnosis, but actually like, so in order to truly heal my toe, I had to ask people to help me get around. I had to ask people to get me ice. I had to ask people to um, bring me food and do like laundry for me and all these other things. Um, you know, leave me alone sometimes so I could just wail and cry and scream into a pillow or the hallway or wherever it was. <laughs> um, I, I needed people. And unfortunately, I think the way that I had been, I, up until I started really working with these women, I, I really thought of it as a process of self-repair, but that um, was really aimed toward a cure and not one that is about a community practice of care, of deep care, 
um, in which you know we are responsible to and for each other, and so um, and not without responsibility for for self. Um, but what they taught me is that healing is about growing capacity. It's about um, in a theater class. It's also about uh, confronting the narratives that have um, depleted us, marginalized, oppressed, ruined, destroyed, and taught us that we are disposable, and creating instead a space in which we can say, no, I see you, I see you, I see you. I do not see the story about you. You are not the mistake that you have allegedly done or been convicted of. You are not the mistake. We are bigger, human beings are bigger than the mistakes that we have been accused of, or the limitations that have been foisted upon us. And so healing in that space was often showing up, being present, and being a witness. And to say to them, no, you are seen. You are seen. You are heard. You are understood. And most importantly, because you know, 85, 95% of people, women who are behind bars, are survivors of sexual assaults that happened before they were 13 years old, and survivors of domestic violence, saying to them, I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. And I hear for you. And you matter. You matter. And that is something that they never got until theater class, which is ridiculous. But that is our messed up you know, social system. That's our social justice system. That's our, our justice system. That's our medical care system. Uh, um, that's our system. That's our families. That, um, that is the water that we are swimming in. So it doesn't seem like much to say to a survivor, I believe you. But it created um, healing as a process of self-repair requires breaking those scripts that we have been taught in which we are disposable and nothing, you know, and creating that space and showing up and saying you matter created a space so that people could have a little break in that kind of the train that's just running through their head that says I'm shit, sorry, sorry, <laughs> I'm nothing, I'm nothing. And out of that, there's more capacity. No, being a theater person, I, it is not the same as therapy, but it was therapeutic in the moment. And if there can be space when people can imagine other possibilities and step into it, then those lessons, those things build one upon the other, upon the other, upon the other. And it's not a linear process healing, right? It can be, it can be leaps and bounds in moments. And what they needed us to do constantly was to literally show up and hold the space so they could do the work. All I did was say, should we write about this poem? Should we do an improv? That's should we do some dancing? Did. That's not all. That's you a did. big part of what we did. That's a big part of what I'll we did. I'll say a big part, but that's not all you did. It's, yeah. Well, it felt that way, but but what you had to deal with in order to do that, right? I mean, it has an impact, as all ethnographers know, right? You can't go into any community, particularly those that are in in pain, in significant pain, and not have to be emotionally not not just witness, but in a sense be enfolded within the, the, the pain that, that comes with that. So I'm just saying, let's not shortchange what, what you had to be doing there. So, I don't know if I answered your question, uh, yeah, but that was that's a, what yeah, I... That's great, yeah. Um, I think, there was, was there a question still over here? No, okay, so then this woman here, and then we're gonna come over <laughs> here. Oh, well, well, we're gonna come here, and then we're gonna come here, okay? So one, two, and yes, honey, I'm gonna come back. Okay, hi, um, my name's Audrey. I'm. I work with RDI, but that's not why I'm asking this question. Um, so what would it even look like to transform power? Would we want an all black queer board at the University of Chicago, or would that just be replicating the toxic white supremacist culture? What are actionable ways to deinstitutionalize de knowledge production and power outside of white supremacy culture and settler colonial racial capitalism? Distinguished panelists. <laughs> Kathy, looks like you're uh, you're up. I, bat. I know. I'll start with a black queer board of at the University of Chicago. I mean, I'll, I can work. I can work. You'll, with you'll that. take your chances. <laughs> I mean, uh, and and the reason is not because they're we think of it as demographics or group, but positionality relative to normalize and state power, right? Like we are saying that these are folks who have historically been marginalized, who will bring a different perspective and relationship to people, um, will understand the need to distribute power evenly and fairly and justly, who will understand that programs like RDI or Black Studies 
are not outposts of the university, but central to the university, right? Who will understand that in fact, unions are part of what we do when we build institutions to allow people who have less power to collectively negotiate and represent themselves. Or like, I just think that board has a different relationship to normalize capitalist power and therefore would make different policies. And that's why I could start with that board. So. All right, okay, well see, we gotta keep this whole Frazier Ali thing going. Cause all right, so look, but here's the thing. I love what you just said. I was like, yeah. But then I started thinking like this sister here who was at the Ford Foundation for a long time. It's a quite diverse staff, right? No, not the board in that case, but my, oh, well, all right, well, I, I, well, we'll talk about who, who on, on the board side, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but who would they pick for the board? I mean, this is the point. So, I mean, until everybody's ideological framework is adjusted into a, more, a, a social justice frame, then the right. people who are going to be selected, do I have to name Clarence Thomas? You know, again, after all Lori these years, Lightfoot. wait, to, to, you mean to the Ford, not to the No, no, black I'm, queer saying, board, I'm saying, I'm saying, look, like, we got yeah. a black, you got, now we have a, a sister, but for all these years, we've been looking at Clarence Thomas, yes. right? And he has been of no use whatsoever, despite uh, yes. uh, all kinds of affirmative action that that brother benefited from. Yes. Right now, he's through the door. He's like, shut that muff right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and, and booby trap just, it. Don't I'm just booby shut trap it. Booby trap it. Right. So when you try exactly. to get through. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm yeah. just saying, I mean, I'm not against what you said. I, yeah. I'm just saying I would use the phrase more likely that the groups would be more likely because Ooh, trust me you have been trained in the academy more like yes more don't, don't like assume we have black women Christian. running police forces we have we have a yeah, whole lot we don't of have things. a lot of black queer uh, people well, running police forces no we don't have a lot but my point is that they don't automatically not do police forces yeah i'm, yeah, just, I'm, I'm just i'm just asking yeah. us to, we're in agreement I'm we are saying, i'm trying to I, parse for the sake of having people not be eminently disappointed when absolutely. their expectations think, are not I, met. Let me take, oh, I'm not gonna take anything back, but let me say, I think, I think the idea is to, is to both recognize that boards of trustees like the ones at all of these institutions are not just white, but come from a certain relationship to capitalism and power, yes. Yes. right? Thank and you. that I'm the transformation you. of that needs to happen, That's whether it's representation of faculty, staff, and students on boards. We can go through a whole list. Right. And I think Audrey's point was, if we had a different type of board with different commitments and experiences and relationships to power and profit, right. that in fact, that would produce a different type of, possibly a different type of university. 100%. Okay. How do we get there? Okay, I, I, well, I'm we sorry. have to check out these questions over we here before we, people? this gentleman here and then this person up in the front here. Yes, got you. Can't see it all, man. First of all, I wanna say thank you ladies for an outstanding contribution. I, like the queen here, I'm from Southside, grew up in Washington Park educated at Mount Carmel and Woodlawn, live in Bronzeville now and actually redoing a place in Woodlawn because I want to be closer to the university so I can do some more things with the university. But my question has to deal with some points that were raised. My name is Julius Rhodes, by the way. My question has to deal with some points that were raised earlier. We all know that we're dealing with trauma, whether it's in an institutional university setting, professional setting, trauma abounds in everything we do. And so the issue of psychological safety is there. But what have you seen or have you seen any instances, either institutional in the, in the academy or otherwise, of people really working to overcome the inertia of creating structural freedom and having real institutional accountability? Anybody want to comment on that? Try to Lisa. Well, Lisa, why I don't mean, you go? I do have a, I have a, I have a, I have a story from the ethnography. Um, so I worked with a group of women in the Gulf Coast prison who, uh, their new warden decided that a group of them, black lesbians, uh, kind of masculine identified, um, were wearing their standard issue uniforms in too masculine a fashion. Now, note this was a pair of oversized, like saggy jeans, basically, and a white t-shirt. I don't, there are ways to make that them. <laughs> These folks were not doing that. So it was the standard issue across the prison system, baggy jeans and a white t-shirt. 
he decided that a group of them, black lesbians, masculine identified, were wearing them in too uh, baggy a fashion. So he, too masculine a fashion, I'm sorry. So he stripped them and he put them in what he called the pink dress. No, true story, true story. It has a happy ending though. Um, he put them in the pink dress, which is this hideous like bed sheet, moo moo type thing with, uh, it was, uh, you could see their, their bodies and their underclothes through it, and they absolutely stood out on a compound of 1,200 other people who were wearing the standard blue and white issue. So one of these people comes to drama club Saturday morning, and at first people fall out because it was so ridiculous. But then the story comes out that, yeah, that they were being targeted for their um, gender presentation and their uniform code violations. And so the drama club decided that, because they've been doing this work for 20 years, that they're gonna use their next performance in order to address this issue. And they did, they had to do it really slick, right? They just created the middle of this other play about beauty, which they're already working on. The prison was like, yeah, you can do a show about beauty. You know, they put this series of scenes about the pink dress and they, um, they uh, happens to be, there's a uh, formerly incarcerated person goes to, uh, looking for work, goes to, um, parole officer gets sent to a job at a ladies boutique that only sells pink dresses come on <laughs> but by the end shenanigans happen and by the end the manager is like you know what you know you don't have to wear a pink dress if you can do the job you can wear you can wear pink pants so but along with this so the drama club's doing this and at the same time there was a group of femme identified people who saw saw the pink dress as an opportunity and so they serially violated the uniform code and then got themselves in their pink dress and then walked over to the mattress factory where there are a bunch of women who were seamstresses and got that stuff styled. Oh. <laughs> and so they walked onto the compound like, what? Yes, I haven't been in a dress in five, 10, 50 years. I'm gonna rock my pink dress. So my, my point is that, about, so by the time, you know, the, between the show and the actual like violation, <laughs> <laughs> when he realized that he had no power to actually dictate how people were going to style their uniforms, their state issued uniforms, that he shouldn't be fighting this battle, that the, he didn't realize where he was. He didn't realize where he was. And so, no, they could not, you know, abolish the uniform policy, but they abolished the, they managed to end the policing in that form of the so called violation of the policy and he realized with time that you know he, yes he may have had this fundamentalist christian values but if he was going to survive at this women's facility then he was going to have to change his thinking about what the role was of the community there because those women lived there he just worked there they were in charge no did this story abolish the prison system as we know it it did not but it certainly made people's lives a little easier for a little while and it it transformed a dialogue that was happening because of the way they enacted perform did i know perform people are like oh it's just art you're just faking it the performative means it's fake but no 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 real life consequences of the doing of gender right. and if we keep on showing up and living our values and stepping into our wholeness which is what these women did in a very dangerous situation all of them could have been put in the hole but instead they were like, no, 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 no. We're in charge. You just work here. So I think there's the opportunities for us, you know, if we can, part of it is like changing our mindset about and, and engaging in collective action. So, cause that was, no, one person showing up in the pink dress did not do it. It was, everybody got on board when they realized what the threat was. And then they got, they got to action in really creative and imaginative ways. Beautiful, thank you, Lisa. Ooh. We have this last question here because I think we're going to get ready for lunch. Go ahead. You're our last uh, question. Oh, he needs a mic. I'm sorry. My, my. Oh, here. He's over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Who, who did I miss? Well, I'll do. Yes, we can. I'm sorry. I don't know where that person is, but I'll be. Do you want to maybe take those oh, questions? Okay, got you. okay, no, you go ahead, sir. No, no, no. We'll take him first. Okay. We'll... All right. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the panelists for giving such a very insightful uh, presentations. So my name is Desire Chiwandire. I'm from South Africa, which is where I did my doctoral studies, focusing on disability studies in higher education. I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Illinois in Chicago with the Department of Disability and Human Development. So my question is actually directed to uh, Eugene and uh, 
Lisa and uh, Kathy, because that kind of resonates with my research. So starting with Eugene, I just want to know, you spoke about the methodological contestations when it comes to doing research, drawing on community-oriented methodologies, like the challenges that you experience, which is also kind of resonates with the challenges that I'm experiencing trying to decolonize disability studies using Ubuntu philosophy. So you find out that like most journals, in as much as they are opening space to decolonial uh, scholarship, but there's still a lot of resistance if it's something that is coming from the global south. And there's a lot of explanations that one has to make within the field that is predominantly global north. So I just want to know from you, like, what have you been doing to, you know, to keep going? And, you know, what can you encourage like-minded scholarships, scholars, you know, to keep pushing? And then secondly, when you know, it... No, we, we don't have... <laughs> in order to get her in, we're going to have to take one question. Okay. okay? That was a fantastic question. Let, oh. I'm, get her. I'm sorry. I know. We just, sorry. Well, I, we can't, I, I wish we could hear the others. No, but, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to make sure we can get her in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The conversation will keep going. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a kind of a, uh, I don't know how people will take this, but for me, uh, it has really been about developing my citation index, like cita my like citation politics, you know. Um, and so I like read uh, and cite as actively proactively as I can the folks who have already written like why these methodologies are rigorous, valid, legitimate, et cetera, and that they are rooted in um, actual theories or like systematic theories, um, even if they're not necessarily recognized to be that way um, all the time. And so continually coming, like saying like that's so, so citation as like political praxis almost. Um, so that's one way that I um, have, have um, sort of tried to push back against um, against those those kinds of challenges um and then the other thing too is you know this actually goes back to my previous uh response is that um really refusing to allow the university to dictate what is counted as legitimate um and really understanding like how, that that it's it's a real principle it's a practice it's a discipline to actually like continue to refuse all those I think of them as like there's constantly like arrows, sometimes big, sometimes small, just like always coming at you. Um, and so like constantly, um, uh, what is it, protecting yourself from that or combating that um, by by coming back to that principle that like I'm not, I'm just not like the university doesn't get to decide whether this is legitimate or not because I have a whole host of ancestors and um, scholars and community and um you know really like who 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 can tell them who can tell the university that's bs this is real this is legitimate this is real theory you know um and this is a real way of knowing and so um so I'll, I'll, let me stop there yeah oh, that's really great thank you thank you all right that's really great answer to a great question yes here you got right. the mic excellent hi um my name is yolanda joe uh i wanted to give a extra shout out to trish we actually went to yale together back in 19, uh -huh. <laughs> sang in the gospel choir. Wanted to let you know how proud I am of you, of your work and your advocacy and just your, just the way all of you ladies have brought your authentic selves in the room. Uh, my question is this, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Uh, my parents had substance abuse problems, so I grew up here in the neighborhood. And my grandmother found a program that was on the University of Chicago's campus and they took us around They said, bring the kids here, they're in high school. Um, and at the time, you had to be at Hyde Park High School, which at that time had the highest dropout rate in the state. And they put us on the campus and they gave us lectures and they showed us different museums. And that made me know that I belonged on a college campus. My question is, I took that advocacy and worked in journalism and other forms. That lets people know you got next. What is the role of black faculty and race and freedom on our campuses and these, these different universities, because those programs have shrunk and they're non-existent in many places, to let these kids know they have next, to find them a place and give them view, because you can't be what you can't see on these campuses. 
I'll just I'll just pipe in. It doesn't look like it. <laughs> I have to check their faces. Oh, that's a great. First of all, we're gonna have to chit chat. I, I can't. First of all, I can't barely see. I don't know what's wrong with these glasses. <laughs> but um, so I'm gonna come find you. Yes. Um, I mean, what what's happened to a lot of those programs, from my experience, is that they've been turned into summer sort of uh, accreditation, sort of mini accreditation centers, and they're they're actually profit engines for universities, which is not what this was intended to be. Um, and so I don't know how much we can um, expect, particularly these extremely elite urban campus schools to be as responsible as they have historically been. And so, so the question would be, what can black faculty and other allied faculty do? And I, I've been, I think we need to really use non-classroom based communication spaces. First of all, we do need people to be brought to the campus and centers like my center and the center here that's my twin center, we all need to do more of that. We have art exhibits, we bring students through, but we need to really do more of what you're saying, a more almost structured relationship, right, that, that gets, and we have the students who would be amazing. I'm sure the University of Chicago kids would be great, the Brown students, right, could be very helpful in saying, hey, I, I didn't belong here two years ago either, right, and here I am. Um, so I think that's another way to do it. But I also think we have way more resources at our disposal than we did when most of us in here were kids. That is to say the internet and the, the, the capacity to build spaces of learning and exchange really I think is an, an underutilized um, space for, for this kind of work. It wouldn't replace the work you're describing, but I think it could bridge the gap because that's where most people are. They're on the internet, right? And then they could be sort of connected. Um, and, and so I've been trying to do some work on that um, myself. But anyway, I, I think it's a really, really good question. Do you all want to end on any note here on this uh, final question? Nothing to give in? Well, you all have been magnificent. Thank you so, so much. Please thank them for their amazing answers to really great questions. Really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you. And now we have our fearless leader, Gina, who well, will take us or just to lunch. the person who stands up and tells you where to go next. So um, thank you to all of you. This, wow. So we have a bit of a break, and then we're going to journey to uh, kind of two doors down to Logan, where we will have lunch and then start uh, the rest of our programming for the rest of the afternoon. So you have a bit of a moment to kind of stretch. And if you want to um, do your business here, you can do that um, or do whatever you would like. But we're, we're walking down the street two doors down and I will see you all there momentarily. So thank you.